his word tonight as we talk about Peter and God restoring him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the news that Jordy is doing well. And uh, Father, we praise you for it not being more serious. And we just pray that she's able to come home soon. And uh, so Lord, we pray for the family as these are difficult times. You drop someone off and you can't go in, you can't be with them. Uh, Patients are alone, difficult times. So Lord, we just pray that you, as we know you will, just give her rest and she will draw close to you. And we thank you so much for this message. We thank you for the life of Peter. He, unlike, not unlike most of us, making many mistakes in his words and things he did, and we get to see how the Lord just blessed him in spite of that and drew him close and restored him to be a powerful witness for you. And so, Lord, we thank you so much for the evening. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. amen. So actually, this is a somewhat of a two-part message because I'm with you tonight. Matthew will be back next week. And then two weeks from tonight, I'll be back. And so I decided that uh, I would carve this up into two pieces. And uh, the title of my message is Peter Restored. And the text tonight is going to be out of Luke chapter 22. It's only a couple of verses But you've been in the Bible very long, you know that you don't need very many verses to find powerful lessons for our life, such as Jesus wept. I could talk for a long time on that, amen? So sometimes I pick these short verses and people ask me, wow, two verses. I'm like, well, if I would have picked five, I wouldn't have got through it all. So we're just going to do two. And it's because there's a lot included in what's going on in Luke. And uh, so I just thought I would would do that, and I was blessed by the preparation, and uh, so honored, as always, to fill in for either one of our pastors who normally teach on the weekends. So my experience in some 60 years, and I know that none of you think I could be 60, right? But my experience in 60 years, 40 of those or more has been following the Lord Jesus. And in that time, I have encountered all kinds of people, friends, my own challenges in life, heartaches, situations that challenged me, challenged my faith. Some of us might even say some of those challenges threatened to overwhelm our faith at times. Now, we're living in days. We're living in days right now where many are filled with fear. People you know are filled with fear. They grab on to information to feed that fear, and a certain amount of information is fed to them. As a matter of fact, I've been, I spend a fair amount of time reading, trying to find articles to, to have some balance in what we are given to hear, and recently discovered that there's a large number of highly credentialed medical professionals who suggest that stress And anxiety is fast becoming the number one cause of death. Stress and anxiety is fast becoming the number one cause of death. Now, I don't have time to get into that. So I'll let you wrestle with why that could be in the days we live in. Tonight, we come to one of the most famous conversations in the Bible that Jesus had with anyone. And before we get to the text in Luke, I'm going to set up the scenario that we're in with the passage out of Matthew, chapter 26. And I'm going to be reading a few verses. They won't be up on the screen, but you're welcome to follow along in your Bibles or in your iBibles or whatever you might have. I'm going to be reading Matthew 26, starting in verse 31, to set up our text tonight in Luke. Then Jesus said to them, you will all fall away because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike down the shepherd and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. But Peter answered and said to him, even though all may fall away because of you, I will never fall away. 
Jesus said to him, truly I say to you, this very night before the cock crows, you shall deny me three times. Peter said to him, even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. All the disciples said the same thing too. Hmm. Now, as we know, Peter, there Peter sits. Lord, I will never fall away. A most boastful declaration, don't you think? By any man. And yet we know that it ended with a catastrophic personal failure in Peter's life. A failure that shook him to the core almost causes his faith to collapse. Now this is what we're going to be talking about tonight. Because Jesus is getting to tell, is going to tell Peter three important facts about his troubles that are going to enable him to endure and get through it. Don't we have troubles? Do we not sometimes wonder how we're going to get through it? There is much for us to learn from Peter and his relationship with Jesus, but even more to learn about our Lord's heart and how much he loves us. We'll get through it. Peter will get through it and survive it in a biblical, Christ-like way. A little background here in this, in this text. So they're obviously eating the Passover meal, the Seder meal, if you will, with his disciples the night before he was betrayed. So we call this the Last Supper. And in the just a few hours from this text, Peter is going to experience the failure that we just talked about. Denying the Lord three times and then in the shame of it, in the shame of doing that, he's going to slip away, quit the ministry, and go back to fishing. So we're going to see how Jesus responds to that. How, we, how he may respond to us through this lesson when we slip away and think, Lord, I am just not worthy. Where are you in the midst of this struggle? He never left. He never left. Most likely you've encountered someone who has walked away from their faith or perhaps said, I don't have time for the church. Where was the Lord in the midst of my challenge and my struggles? We know people like that. They might be in your family. You may have experienced that yourself and then came back just like Peter. So let's take a look at the text. Luke 22, two verses, verses 31 and 32. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission. I'm going to come back to that word. Permission to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. Your faith may not fail. And when once you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. I'm just going to stop right there. When once you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. So when you take in the entire account of Peter here and his denials of Jesus, we are reminded right away, God's authority is over all. His authority is over all. Peter, Satan himself is asking my permission to sift you. So let's look at that. Nobody asks permission from someone who has less authority, does a Colonel asked permission of a private? Would one of your children expect you to ask their permission before you do something? They might hope so. They might dream of such an event. But it wouldn't have happened in my house. A parent from a child? No. We only ask permission from someone who has more authority, a greater authority, a higher authority than we. So you have to ask yourself, who in the universe, who in the universe has more authority, higher authority than the very prince of demons himself? We know the answer is almighty God himself. It gives me chills to think of it. 
My point is the devil had to ask Jesus for permission to act against Peter here. Yet one more proof, yet one more proof, if you're looking for one more, one more proof that Jesus really is Jehovah God in the flesh, exactly as he claimed to be. Amen? What did Satan ask of Jesus? Well, Jesus said Satan asked to sift you like wheat. Now, in ancient days, you do a little research. Ancient days, farmers would take wheat grain. This was very hard grain. Put it in a machine and called a sifter. And they grind it over and over and over until soft, clean flour resulted. Hmm. So Satan was asking to crush to crush Peter into flour, using his fears to deny the Lord, then the shame of it all, the embarrassment that followed. He would get him to give up spiritually, leave the ministry. Satan definitely had a plan here. Does he not look to consume us, to devour our families, to discourage us as parents, our children? I always say the world we live in has a lot of candy for our kids. Most of it is absolutely no good. Satan wanted to crush Peter. Huh. But in verse 32, if you read it again, it's clear to me that Jesus has granted Satan's request. Why is it so clear? Well, he's coming after Peter to eliminate her permanently as a servant of Christ. And Jesus says... I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. He's not saying I told Satan to leave. I prayed that your faith will not fail. He allowed Satan, but there were limits to what he allowed from Satan. So what we know is trials sift us. Trials sift us, but God restores us. We're not immune to trials. I've had many The fact that I'm not in a trial just means one will be coming. Right? Some of you are in that space. Some of you are in the midst of a trial right now. And this message is certainly for you. Jesus says right here, he is going to, it's going to be rough, Peter. But your faith will not fail. You will recover. You will return And when you do, use what you learned from this sifting experience to encourage and strengthen the people around you of God. My greatest growth times in my life came when I was in the midst of storms. And early in our marriage, those storms might have been the loss of a job. And my dear wife would say, what's the worst thing that could happen? Oh, come on, don't ask me a question like that. Let me be miserable, you know. It's the worst thing that could happen. And I would say things like, we might lose a house. Okay, that all you got? One of my greatest growth moments was when she said to me as a young family, your children adore you, your wife loves you. What's the worst thing that can happen? We lose a house. So all of that love we have as a family can just go somewhere else. Be fine. The Lord got this. Wow. I was ready for the next trial. Shouldn't have said it because I got one. But this is what's happening here. It's exactly what happened. Yes, Satan got Peter denied Jesus. He got Peter to, to leave broken. Yes, Peter went back to fishing. Satan may have thought he had won. But oh no, not so. We need only look in John chapter 21, and we won't read through it, but Jesus came after Peter in John 21. He revitalized his faith in John 21. He restored him to the ministry. He went on to be a mighty servant of God whose New Testament servant sermons, after all of this, his New Testament sermons and letters, 
strengthen the hearts of God's people even to this day. After he denied Christ three times. Some of us beat ourselves up so much when we fail that we're forgetting that Jesus is sitting right beside us. He's got his arm around us. If he lives inside of you, he is sovereign. He is in you. He hears you complain. He hears you fret. He is sovereign. He's just waiting for you to give him an opportunity to love on you, restore you. He pursued Peter. He pursues us. I bet we all have a testimony of some time that we just thought, no more, God, I, can't, I just can't do it anymore. Or before you knew him, you'd run from him and you kept having these Christians show up. People loving on you and saying, I'm going to pray for you. God pursues us. Some may push him away or cry out, where are you, Lord? But I suggest to you, he never left. He never left. It's exactly what Jesus does. My next point, God protects us. He protects his children. He is the strong man here. He is the strong man here. Who else would you want to join up the world? My goodness. He is the strong man. So how about you complete the following sentence and we'll have a little exercise. Right there in the quiet of your seat. Don't want to embarrass anyone. Right there in the quiet of your seat, I want you to think about the biggest problem or heartache or trouble in your life right now. What is that right now? Most of you in an instant probably know. The rest of you will think about it here in two or three seconds. The biggest problem in your life right now, it might be health. It might be health. Or I suggest to you what I suggested earlier about what the doctors are beginning to say. It might be the mental suffering of having a loved one in the hospital and you're not allowed to visit. The first thing that Pastor Rich told me this morning was, well, I didn't get much sleep last night. Jordy went into the hospital at 10, and they admitted her at 1, and I wasn't allowed to be with her. I heard in his voice a loving husband who couldn't be with his wife, not my senior pastor. It's just a loving husband who could not be with his wife. Couldn't, I could not be with her. Maybe it's a work situation that you're in. And if I take that in today's, the life of our people in work situations today, that might mean that you're exacerbated by the pressure to get vaccinated against your choice. It's not a pro or con position, but as an employee, people are telling you you don't have a choice, creating much heartache, much heartache. I know because I get those phone calls. Lots of them. Lots of them. Maybe it's parenting. Always makes the list of stressful, problematic challenges. Is perhaps it's the, where you are in your journey with parenting or children. And of course, marriage brings its challenges. The day we live in challenges marriages. And I'd love for you and... All of my friends that I know, all of my married friends, I'd love for them to put me out of business upstairs in my office and counseling, but I'm still there. So I know it makes the list of challenges. Satan loves that, by the way. He loves to challenge our families. Then I found Job 14.1. You know, you can't talk about challenges in families without somewhere ending up in Job. 14.1 says, man who is born of woman is short-lived and full of turmoil. Wow. I spent some more time in Job, so I found another verse I'll read in a minute. But in Luke 22, Jesus shared with us three important facts about our troubles to help us endure them, to help make it through them. No greater time than the times we live in to be reminded that he's right there with us to help us. 
Number one, our troubles are all inspected. They are all inspected by him. In Luke 22, verse 31, Jesus, Satan says he had to ask permission to sift Peter like wheat. With these words, Jesus reveals to us a great principle for us. As followers of Jesus Christ, Satan must get permission. This wasn't just a one-off story about Peter. This is how Jesus reigns as king of kings over darkness. He is the strong man. He had to get permission from Almighty God before he could lay a finger on a follower of Christ, Peter. Insert your own name there. He has to get permission. So let's look at it through another biblical account, powerful account in Job. Job 1, going to read several verses, starting in verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, from roaming about on the earth and walking around it. The Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? (laughs) Wow, how'd you like to be that guy? Hey, Lord, just serve me up. (laughs) Have you considered my servant Job? For there is no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, fearing God and turning away from evil. Satan answered, does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a fence around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. But reach out with your hand now and touch all that he has. He will certainly curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not reach out and put your hand on him. So Satan departed from the presence of the Lord. I had a whole new respect for Job just reading that story. Here's a God-fearing man. Satan says, you put this hedge of protection around him. Let me have him without all that protection. Let's see how God-fearing he is. Let's see how the children of Calvary Chapel handle when they become weak, when they forget how much you love them, when they are not in the word, when they're not singing his praises in church, when they're not loving others the way you call us to love. Let's see how they do. And the Lord gives Satan power over his possessions, over his possessions, but not to touch the man. Notice God let Satan inside the hedge. He let him inside that protection. So here we are in Job chapter one, Satan wiped out everything. If you haven't spent much time in Job, read it. But, Job didn't do what? What did Job not do in the midst of this? He did not curse the Lord. How would we do? Well, I don't know. I pray I wouldn't either. That's a, quite a story for us to put on our shoulders and put ourselves in those shoes. And yet I asked you a minute ago, what is the greatest trial or heartache or trouble in your life? Chapter two of Job, Satan is back. He's back and he wants even more latitude with Job because he didn't succeed in getting him to curse the Lord. God gives him over again, but says, you can't take his life. The first time is you can have all those possessions, but don't touch the man. The second time is don't take his life. I'll give you more latitude. But both Luke and And Job, there's three important truths that I want to share with you. One, God set up a hedge of protection around every single follower. He had a hedge of protection around Job. Every follower of Christ, including you and me, a hedge of protection. 
You might not see it, but believe God when he tells us it's there. Number two, we find out Satan must get God's direct permission to go inside that hedge. That gave me great peace. I don't know about you. Just great peace. A few weeks ago, I spoke on the Red Sea, and I said, what's the Red Sea in your life? What's that great challenge? You think about the Israelites. We're angry at Moses for a while because they thought, why did you bring us here? We might have been better off to stay in Egypt. Then God moved. What's the Red Sea in your life? We have lots of them. Mine are mentoring and mentoring and praying for my adult children and my grandchildren. Protection over them gave me great peace to know there's a hedge of protection around them from the Lord himself. Even number three, even when God permits Satan to get inside the hedge as he did with Job, God sets precise limits, precise limits on what Satan is or isn't allowed to do. Don't touch the man. Don't take his life. He is indeed the strong man. Amen. God's word promises endurance for us. His word promises endurance for us. So the bottom line is nothing enters your life as a follower of Christ and nothing enters my life as a follower of Christ unless it has first been inspected and limited by Almighty God himself. So if he allows it, if I find myself in situations that I am uncomfortable with or that are painful, rather than blame him, rather than ask where he is, Lord, you're allowing this. There must be something you want to teach me. It's a completely different perspective when you find it, yourself in that situation. It allows God to make a staggering promise to us in 1 Corinthians 10.13. No temptation has overtaken you except something common to mankind. And God is faithful. So he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will provide the way of escape. Also so that you will be able to endure it. His words, not mine. I am thankful for those words. This is why in Luke 22... Jesus said to Peter, when, when, not if you turn back. I don't know what version you're reading. I'm in New American Standard. And it says, when, not if you turn back. He knew, God knew that Peter could turn back or that he would turn back. Because Jesus had already inspected what Satan was asking and wanted to do to him. And it fell within the limits that he gave Satan on Peter's life. He knew he would turn back. Perhaps some of you have been to the Garden of the Gods in Colorado Springs. I've been there a few times. It's been a while, but I've been there a few times. My parents lived there at one time out that way. There is an enormous gorgeous red cliffs at the Garden of the Gods you can drive through. And there's this tiny little road that runs in and out of there. It's, and I mean tiny. And it weaves around and it comes to the, kind of disappears, the road disappears to this big rock. It's got a crack in it, in the rock. That's the end of that road. It's got a crack in the rock. You couldn't drive a motorcycle through it. Even if you rode one there, you might see able to see through it, but you couldn't drive through it. So no way you get a car through it. Now I read once, because I had been there, I found the article interesting. I'd read once that somebody had put a little sign up on the wall that said, oh yes you can. That's all it said, oh yes you can. And I thought, how apropos, when it comes to our problems and trials in life, God says, oh, yes, you can. Trust me. Trust me. Oh, yes, you can. He is our friend in the midst of that storm. He is not distant. He is not uncaring. He cares about the smallest of details in our life. You can endure it. 
You can get through it. You can survive it. God has already inspected it through the story of Peter. He made sure of it before he allowed it to come to life with Satan. Fact number one, our troubles are all inspected. Fact number two, our troubles all have a divine purpose. They are not accidental or random. They are not accidental or random. We need a godly view of suffering. The first thing I learned when I traveled to Kinshasa with Pastor Rich and I saw the suffering among the Christians there in Calvary's church that we support, and yet I saw the joy on all of these pastors and their wives. And by our definition, they had nothing. And Rich said to me before our first session, we were there for a pastor's conference. His first session, he said, you will learn very quickly that our brothers and sisters in Africa have learned to suffer well. Has not affected their joy in the Lord whatsoever. I felt convicted by what I saw. And one of those uh, young pastors came alongside of me during a break that after I had, I think, had my first session where Rich let me teach to these pastors. And one of them came up and said, because I made comments about the joy I saw and about the difference in our countries. And one came up and said, don't, don't ever feel like you need to apologize for the wealth in America. We thank God here in Africa for the wealth in America because the wealth in America enables people to help us, support us. We do not have access to such things, work, material things, safe housing. We have none of it. So we love our brothers and sisters in America who think beyond their borders. It was quite a perspective. Our troubles all have a divine purpose. They are not accidental or random. So I suggest we need a godly view of suffering. We need a godly view of suffering. I need a godly view of suffering. When Jesus said to Peter, when you turn back again, I want you to strengthen your Christian brothers and sisters. That's basically what he was saying as a result of this sifting experience. When you come out, I will teach you to use the teachings from the trials, what you learned. I will teach you to encourage your brothers and sisters. Peter did exactly that with his life. Exactly that with his life. First Peter is all about suffering. The book of First Peter, all about suffering and pain and heartache and how we can trust God's faithfulness through it. First Peter 5.10 says, after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. After you have suffered. <laughs> Not, we're going to avoid the suffering, I'm just going to give you a pass. Doesn't say that. I've been looking for that verse. Never there. God will make you strong and firm and steadfast, is what his message is to us. Where did Peter learn this lesson? Where did he learn this lesson so he could declare it with passion and certainty as we know Peter would have? Well, we know that he did not learn it from his successes in the book of Acts. Peter learned this from his failures. He learned it from his failures, particularly that night in Jesus when he denied the Lord. Where do we learn and grow the most? Where do we learn and grow the most? For me in my life's history, it was during trials. It's always equipped me for the next one. I laugh. I meet with men all the time who are unemployed. And they know when they come to see me, I've walked in those shoes. And around my house, we kind of laugh about the fact that the third time in my corporate journey that I was unemployed, I said something to my wife like, we should go on vacation. And it was quite a difference than the first time when I said, oh my goodness, what are we going to do? Well, I already knew that God was going to show up. He already had a plan for me. The third time, you know, he'd be saying, haven't you yet learned? He was there for us. 
He supplied our needs in a wonderful way without any panic in us. Now, I don't think my wife let me go on vacation because she manages the budget. But she was probably blessed to know that her husband wasn't crying out to the Lord in fear. He had taken previous trials and taught me much, taught me much. So when I meet with men who are struggling at work, they find out real, in a real big hurry, I'm not um, coming up right beside them to say, yeah, you should really feel bad. It's like, no, where is your faith, my friend? The Lord wants and has gotten your attention. He will. He will supply your needs. He will bless them beyond what you ask for. You show him your love. That's where we learn the most is through our suffering. So when you look at suffering in that way, and the question I asked about what would be the greatest trial or heartache in your life right now, I suggest to you that trouble is actually our friend in disguise. Might seem like an odd thing to say. Trouble can, can and should be our friend in disguise. So am I saying that every problem has a purpose? Yeah, pretty much. What's your perspective? What's your filter? Why did I lose my job, pastor? I don't know exactly how to answer that question. But he had a purpose for it in your life. He has a plan for you. Why did my parents treat me so poorly when I was growing up? Or why do I have these chronic health problems? Or why did that person I love so much have to die? I can't tell you why. I can't. But I can tell you that God has a divine purpose for it in your life. We have to learn to look at all these heartaches and problems and acknowledge that trouble... The trouble you are in is a friend in disguise because God is going to use it to teach you something. He's going to use it to teach you something, something real important. Lessons that are not only a blessing for you in the future, but maybe blessing for someone else. How many of us have gone through something really tragic, really difficult, and sometime later, Someone comes up to you and you're now through that episode in your life. You've recovered. God has restored you. And someone you know comes up and says, this just happened in my family. Or I know that you went through this. Could you share about that experience with this person? Because they are just hurting so bad. And I didn't walk in those shoes. How can I speak to that? And all of a sudden, God uses you and your experience going through an awful time to minister to someone else. Couldn't, couldn't have done that with you if you hadn't have gone through it. It happens all the time. All the time. And in ministry, Pat, Matthew and Rich and myself, we have all had different life experiences. We are all very different. Except that we love Jesus Christ. And we all know what each other's life experience has been. And so we encounter things all the time where people need ministry. They need ministering too. And it is easy to walk next door and say, Matthew, I have a brother that's going through this and I know that you went through that. Would you mind taking a minute? No problem. What a blessing. He uses those things in our life to give us a broader platform to serve him. So finally, not only are all of our troubles inspected and are they for a divine purpose, but fact number three, our troubles are all overridden. What do I mean by that? Well, how about a familiar verse, Romans 8, 28. We know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. God promises us that he will take every trouble Every heartache, every problem, he will turn them into blessings. What's the verse say? For those who love God. Some forget that. You may be here tonight, you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord. And you're thinking, oh, he's never shown up. Oh, he's there. But he's there for a different purpose. 
He's there because he's calling you to himself. To say, Lord Jesus, I can't do this anymore by myself. Come into my life. Save me, Lord. Help me. Give me wisdom I don't even know what to ask for. Help me in my marriage. Help me in my health. Help me with bad habits. Help me with my addiction. Lord, I can't do it anymore. All things work together for good to those who love God. God is ready to restore you too. Just like Peter, he is ready to restore you too. Exactly what happened to Peter in Luke 22. He had a catastrophic failure denying Christ three times. But did Jesus overrule that failure? In spite of that failure, God turned him into a mighty servant, didn't he? Didn't abandon him. Galatians 2, 7. Paul says, but on the contrary, seeing that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been the circumcised. Paul tells us that Peter was entrusted by God here to preach the gospel to the Jews. Now that's an amazing commission for him to have, for Peter, that the Lord gave him. In the book of Acts, Peter is the central figure in the book of Acts to carry the gospel to the nation of Israel and to the Jewish people. Look from where he came. I denied you three times. And Paul says in Galatians 2.9, he called Peter a pillar of the church, a pillar of the church. He is not done with any of us. He is not done with any of us. My point here is before Peter failed in that night in Jerusalem, God had already overridden his failure. He already had a plan for him. He already had it worked out into his perfect plan to redeem that failure and make it something of a blessing in Peter's life. So when you're going right through the midst of it, maybe you feel distant, haven't prayed in a while, haven't been in the Bible, don't feel like going to church. The Lord is so far out ahead of you planning your next steps. He's just waiting on you to say, here I am, Lord, help me. And then put your seatbelt on. He will use you in a powerful way. He did the same thing for Joseph. Long before his brother sold him into slavery. God had already overridden that. Worked it out for him to do what? Become prime minister of Egypt. And when God glorifies himself, it's not just a little thing. Or how about young Esther? Long before her parents died. He already worked it out and turned it into her becoming the queen of Persia, saving her people. He already worked it out. He already was overriding what was going on in her life. So as a follower of Jesus Christ today, before any problem or crisis strikes your life, you can be sure God has already overridden it. His perfect plan for you. Remember, he has a hedge around you. He has a plan for you. His perfect plan for your life is already designed with a blessing in mind. God wants to restore you too. It's a completely different perspective when you walk into that next heartache. It's like, Lord Jesus, I know you have a plan for my life. I'm going to focus on that. And thank you for what you're going to teach me through this. Show me how to minister in my family if I'm going through a hard time. Lord, be my rock if I lose something in my life or someone in my life that is so, means so much to me, Lord, I'm grieving, but I know when I come out of this, you have a plan for me. It's a whole different perspective for you, perhaps. Now, many of you can give testimony that you're a better husband, maybe, or you're a better wife, or a better father or mother. Maybe you're a better leader because of some significant challenge in your life that you went through. And before these things came into your life, God had already designed it to turn it into a blessing. And you can look back on it and think, oh, there's no way I could have done what I did if I hadn't have gone through that. And in the time you started going through it, Lord, I don't want to go through this. Why am I going through this? Because he had a better plan. He had to get your attention, perhaps. He allowed things to happen. Now, you may be thinking about that 
thing I asked you to put in that blank space earlier. You might be thinking about that. And you might be saying, you just can't possibly see one thing that that situation you're in will turn into good or blessing. And I suggest to you, it really shouldn't matter to us. It doesn't matter what God has promised. It, matters, it doesn't matter that we understand. Remember, his ways are not our ways. He tells us that throughout the scriptures. It's far more important that we just trust him for his promises. Many, many more promises. Do a study on all of God's promises and you'll be ready to conquer any challenge. We all had something to fill in that blank. All of us had something for that blank. Some of us have gone through some really tough times and I don't discount those whatsoever. We're sitting here asking why God, I just can't answer that question for you. I can't answer that necessarily even for myself. But I can tell you the three things about yours and my troubles that give us strength when we need it. Your troubles have been inspected and limited by God. Psalm 46.10 says, be still. I love this verse. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Your troubles have all been inspected and limited by God. Your troubles and my troubles have a divine purpose. They are not random or coincidental. Remember, embrace those troubles, perhaps, in a different way. Friends in disguise, I call it. Friends in disguise. And number three, our troubles have already been overridden by a sovereign God in his perfect plan for our lives, planning to bless us and show us a better plan when we come out of these times that we might be in. We can't always understand them all. But I want to focus on his promises, that he's the strong man, and that he has already shown himself strong for me in my life. If you've been a Christian for any time at all, you could stand right here next to me and say the exact same thing. He has shown me over and over again that yes, it was tough. Yes, it was hard. Yes, it was very hard. But he was right there with me the whole time. And I never doubted that. Even in the painful times, I know he had a plan for me. These facts will get us through all kinds of trouble in life if we will learn these facts. And focus on his promises. It's freeing really. And the days we live in are certainly no exception. I suggest he's preparing us for eternity right now. Come soon I'd say. Come soon. Protect our families. So for some of you. Many of you I hope a new perspective on how you like Peter. Were restored. As you walk by faith. Hard yes. Yes. Can you do it? Absolutely. Let's pray. Father, we sit in the quiet of our seats as we, our heart worships as a worship team comes. Lord, our hearts sing out because all of us filled in the blank with something that was troubling for us. Maybe it, it's already passed and we're reflecting now on what you taught us, what you have for us. Maybe some of us are in the midst of a storm right now and Lord, you're speaking to them saying, I'm right there with you. I have not left. Trust me. Read my promises. Read my character. The Lord is telling you, he does not contradict himself. And for what he did for Peter, what he did even in the life of Job, he doesn't contradict himself. He will not be a different person for you. And Lord, maybe some of us are in a place right now of peace and no great troubles, depending on our definition of trouble. And we know the scripture says that trials will come. 
trials will come. So Lord, I pray that we just have the perspective to invite you to be part of that process knowing that it will come. And Lord, I'm here. I know you have more to do with me. My days, my numbered days are not over. So here I am, Lord. Teach me, draw me close. Show me how to minister to others that are not in this place of rest, but who are in this place of trouble. Open my eyes, Lord. Let me be an ambassador for you and help others with these even perhaps tragedies that I've been through. Father, each one here just needs the encouragement of the Lord Jesus Christ in the day we live in with so much surrounding us that's confusing, challenging us, Mandates has become an everyday term. Restrictions have become an everyday term. Some of us might feel like we're refugees in our own state. And Lord, you have a plan. You are the king of kings, and you have a plan. And you have a hedge of protection around us, and we trust you with that. So, Lord, I just thank you so much for your word. I thank you that Peter was just like us. He was real. He was weak. He was boastful. And then he failed. And, Lord, you picked him up and drew him close and made him a mighty servant for you. Just like us. Use us. So, Lord, we enter into worship now to praise your name and to celebrate that we have a hedge of protection around us that you have already tested the waters ahead of us for anything we go through. We know we have you on our side. Thank you so much for that peace and that promise. And we give you thanks tonight for it in Jesus' precious name and all God's people said, amen. Well, God bless